Uh, we still do not have a name for this podcast, but uh, I just couldn't wait to get started and give you guys some insight into our uh, awesome program. And so today, I've got one of my best friends on with me, Nate Sestina, who agreed to do the show. And forced into it. <laughs> uh, as you guys very well know, Nate's one of the uh, easiest guys to talk to, so this should be a lot of fun. Uh, Nate, first thing we'll start with is how you feeling for the blue-white scrimmage tonight? I feel pretty confident. We, we've really been working hard in practice, and things are starting to click. And hopefully everything continues to click while we get out there today. But I feel pretty good. I mean, I've been in the gym with KP, and I've been in the gym with Joel a little bit, and just working on catching and shooting, getting into the middle of the lane, finishing, driving kick, relocating, and making sure my feet are good for knocking down shots and then just trying to be a good teammate. So tonight, me and you kind of – come from similar backgrounds you know we've both played uh at good low major basketball programs I talked to uh Joel yesterday during practice and I asked him about how many people we expected to be there tonight and he told me about 12,000 oh my god you know for a scrimmage so that's obviously you know something I'm not used to I don't think you're used to that tell me uh just kind of about your transition to Kentucky basketball going from a place where you had good fans but it's just it's not the same in the Patriot League where you come into the best fan base in college basketball. How's it been? I mean, it's been a lot of fun. I have like I played an NCAA tournament two years in a row, and the first time I walked out there as a sophomore, and we were in Buffalo. We played West Virginia, and the game before us was Notre Dame Princeton, and like that was a really great game. Big, yeah, great and game. So like all the fans that could stay stayed in like the upper part, and then like they emptied out the bottom and filled it out. And there was I think there was like twenty one thousand people there or something like that. I walked out and I was like, "Oof, I don't know if I'm gonna make a shot today." Like <laughs> I, it was in warmups and I was like, "I don't know if I'm gonna make anything." In my junior year, um, we had been on a roll. We won like 12 straight games going into the NCAA tournament, and I was feeling really, really confident. I played a really, really good game in the conference championship. Walk out for warmups, and we're playing Michigan State in Detroit, which is somehow I don't know how that happened. Like that was absurd, <laughs> but. There was just green everywhere, and it was a little intimidating, but there was, I think there was 22,000 people there, and so playing at Big Blue Madness on Friday was very similar to that, where you walk out, and there, but like, for the first time, I've had more than 5,000 people cheering for me, Mm -hmm. so being here and kind of finding the difference between here and Bucknell is just like, there's so many, like, people everywhere Mm -hmm. you go, and, and playing in front of... 23, 24,000 people that are cheering for you has been a lot of fun. Speaking of Big Blue Madness, you uh, you kind of stole the show, hit a few deep threes, had a couple <laughs> big-time dunks. Uh, just tell me about what was going through your mind, how you how you enjoyed your first Big Blue Madness, what it was like. Uh, there's a great article written by Kyle Tucker of The Athletic. Uh, you know, you got your family got to come in town. I know not all of your family, but your two sisters, your parents. Uh, how was that? It was great. I mean – for anybody who knows me, they know that those those four people and then my, my brothers are six of the most important people in my life. And um, for my parents to be able to get down here, uh, thanks to my sister Jen, um, they drove to Pittsburgh, which is about three hours from us, and then about a six-hour drive from here to Pittsburgh. Uh, and then my sister Kristen left at three in the morning, and it was an eight-hour drive from Virginia, where she lives now. Uh, it just shows everybody – that like they're dedicated to this and that they they're trying to live it up too. We only have one year of it, so they're really trying to t- trying to soak it all in. And for them to be able to get here and have good seats and mm-hmm. and be able to watch it live for the first time was awesome. Like I I came out and I gave my mom a hug and she had tears in her eyes and she was just like, "This is so crazy." Still, like when you committed, it was crazy. When we came on your visit, it was nuts. And then now that they got to kind of see everything in full force, it was it was pretty special. Uh, is your is any of your family going to be able to make it up to the opener in New York? Yeah, my uh, my sister Kristen, um, my mom and dad, and then my brother Jason. Uh, he lives in New Jersey, so he's going to be able to take the train into the city. And then um, I have a couple of people from my hometown that that were able to get tickets uh, online, so they're all they're all coming in. But I mean, they're I think they're going to be like up up high. But even still, they get to watch me play and. 
Madison Square Garden. So yeah, I don't know about you, but just when it was announced that I was joining the program, you you look at the schedule, and obviously every year Michigan State's you know one of the best programs in the country. We're one of the best programs in the country, the best in my opinion, but I'm a little biased. Uh, and you look, Michigan State preseason number one team, and a lot of publications were number two or number three, mm-hmm. and coming from UC Irvine, you know, coming from Bucknell. Getting to play at Madison Square Garden on ESPN at 7 p.m., number one versus number two, it doesn't even seem real for me that I get to be a part of that. I know my part will be smaller than yours, <laughs> but just that I get to be there and you know take part in that game because I love watching college basketball. Uh, I wouldn't. I'd have that game recorded. You know, I'd watch it and now. It's like, wow. I you know if everyone fouls out, I might get to go in. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about how you're feeling getting to play on that. Obviously, you've played in the NCAA tournament. You've played mm-hmm. in North Carolina. You've played big-time opponents. But it's different when it's two big dogs going at each other. So how are you feeling for that first game? I mean, I'm excited. I I think closer to game time, I'll be a little bit nervous. But you get to play the number one team in the country in like the most historic arena. Yeah, basketball, the Mecca ever, basketball. Yeah, ever, and it's the first game of the year. It's literally like two heavyweights just slugging it out, and I think that our preparation for it so far has been great, and we're going to continue like on the same path. And I mean, hopefully, we end up leaving there with a win. But I think the like the thing for me is it's just like people from my town don't do that. Mm-hmm. People from like you don't get the opportunity to play there ever. And for me, it's just – it's something special. And I'm – like I said before, I'm really just going to soak it all in. No, that's uh, that's what you'd expect from a person of as high of character as oh you. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but talking about uh, you coming to Kentucky, you were the number one grad transfer in the country when, uh, you know, ESPN initially put out their rankings, finished as number two. Uh, what was it like – going through that process of being a low major recruit coming out of high school and then you finish up your senior year of college and all of a sudden you have every high-level college basketball program in the country blowing up your phone begging you to come play for them. I mean, it's super humbling. Um, I, I went into my like, the summer going into my senior year with no offers and um, I, went into, I went to Bucknell camp. Um, played really well there, kind of opened up the coaching staff's eyes a little bit. Um, and thanks to Charles Lee, who's still in contact with me now, um, he's in the NBA, uh, for taking a chance on me and, and telling Coach Paulson to, to offer me a scholarship and them taking a chance and uh, offering me at the end of July. I kind of like blew up in like 14 days where I went into my last stretch of my AAU career with no or with an offer from um, IUP and Coach Lombardi, who I'm really really good friends with. I played AAU with his son Dante. Um, to leaving August or leaving like the July period with like 14 or 15 offers, and then Bucknell being my best one, ultimately committing there, and then going through what I went through in my four years at Bucknell, and then having the opportunity to have a redshirt year and, and play one more year of college basketball. And then being able to talk with some pretty pretty cool coaches while while I'm getting recruited, people you see on TV, it just like it doesn't happen. Like it's just hard to it's hard to explain because people don't understand like where something I'm you got to experience. Yeah, and so if you understand where I'm from and you understand like the coaches I was able to talk to, it's like a dream come true. And then now I get to play for best coach in college basketball every day. So. It's a, it was it was a really, really humbling experience and then like leaving class and you have a, a call from Coach Cal Perry or Coach Barbie and then you have a bunch of other text messages or emails and all this stuff that your phone was kinda of blowing up. It was a little overwhelming, but it ended up being a really, really fun experience and and it's part of who I am now. And speaking of the recruiting process, you were we can pretty much generalize and say you're recruited by every school in the country. If you know if Kentucky recruits you, you can pretty much you can choose where you want to go. What made you decide on Kentucky, especially when you know this is a program where every year they're bringing in five-star, five-star, high-level grad transfers? You know, you got Nate 
uh, I'm sorry, we got Nick and EJ coming back. And you could have walked into a starting spot at any other school. And instead you chose to come here and compete for minutes, compete for whatever happens. Just give me a little, uh, you know, most people don't wouldn't understand that decision. So just walk us through that. I mean, I think Coach Cal, while he's recruiting people and, and – not just recruiting the kid, but like recruiting families too, because like this is a family. The biggest thing is like the challenge that like I mean, Kenny Payne like proposed it, but it was like how hard are you willing to work to make it to where you <clears throat> to like where you want to go? And I literally was sitting in the film room and we got done watching uh, different clips of different guys that have come through here, and Kenny Payne was just like, "All right, now that all that's over." Like, I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to be real. Like, this is going to be the hardest thing that you have ever had to do. Like, are you up for that challenge? And I didn't even think about guys coming back and didn't really think about any of that stuff. I just was like, I, at the end of the day, like, I want to play professional basketball at whatever level I'm able to after this year. And I know that this is one of the best places, if not the best place to do it. You look at the wall in the gym, and there's – 40 guys on the wall. You just look the right wall. behind <laughs> us. Yeah. Yeah. And we're in the locker room, by the way. And that's <laughs> like the most appealing thing in the world. Like you walk in here and you see that, like you want that. And so when a guy like coach Payne offers that up, like that's just something that you c- can't really say no to. I, I think as a competitor, but like as a kid who wants to make it, like that's what was like the most attractive thing to me. And, and my family ultimately and then I went back to the hotel room and sat down with my parents and they were like well what are you thinking and I'm like I want like I want to be pushed I want to be pushed outside my comfort zone I was at Bucknell in my first three four years or my first three years and then my senior year I hit this point where I was playing at like the highest level that I thought I could play at my coaching staff was pushing me every day in practice to get better if I took a possession off they'd hold me accountable or I'd have to run or something like that. And, like, we do that here, and it's just, like, the stakes are just a little bit higher. No, uh, for sure. And you – you've obviously worked incredibly hard since you've been here. I've only been here for about six weeks, but seeing what you've done, you know, and I think not just you. We have a team full of hardworking guys. Is You know, you'd think because they're McDonald's All-Americans, big, you know, number one rated grad transfer, it's it's easy to think we have guys that don't do anything. But we have a – extremely hardworking team and there's a reason guys come here and they improve their draft stock based on the way they play we have coaches that are willing to work with guys we have players that work hard we have support staff that wants our guys to improve and speaking of coming in and working hard uh I don't you obviously knew I couldn't go have you on this podcast and not talk about the uh before and after pictures uh Rob Harris our strength coach posted (laughs) for those of you that don't know Nate is the new heartthrob on campus Uh, (laughs) any girl I go on a date with would rather be sitting with Nate but (laughs) we uh uh it I'm uh I'm okay with that it's something I've accepted oh Uh, my god but just kind of walk me walk us through how that went because obviously you're in good shape. You're playing Division One basketball. Mm-hmm. But you've gone from someone who's in good shape to someone who's in elite shape. What, how, did, how did that conversation start where you're like, you know, the biggest thing when guys make changes is they have to admit that they need to make a change. That's mm-hmm. the most difficult part. Mm-hmm. So how did that start with, like, who – was that something that came from you? Was that something that came from the coaching staff? And then what was the process like of going from good to great? Uh, I, I came in off of a foot injury and – I hadn't been able to run in like two months. So I hurt my foot the last regular season game at Bucknell. Um, I hardly practiced for the conference tournament. I was in a boot and I was always doing rehab and just trying to get by and be able to play in the game. And and that's a lot of like stuff that people don't see. Like they just kind of see you out on the court. They don't see like the stuff that you go through outside of that. And um, so I had put on a lot of weight before coming here and when I got here I was like just disappointed in myself because I was like how could you let yourself get to that point where like you're coming in you're really heavy like you know this is going to be really hard in general like I was just I don't know I was just really disappointed in myself and we went and got our body fat tested and um, got weighed in and I was just like I looked at the scale and stuff and I was like this is this is awful and 
um, I sat down with Rob and he was just like, what are your goals? And I was like, I need to, I want to play like this weight. Um, and I want to get to 235 by the end of the summer. Like I knew that was going to be really, really hard. What are you at right now? If you don't mind. 235. Me Perfect. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I've, I've been playing between like 234 and like 237 in practices and stuff. So, um, <laughs> I've been doing my <laughs> that picture's great. For those of you that are wondering why we are laughing, <laughs> TJ just sent us a picture of Nate's before and <laughs> after with Coach Cow's face photoshopped on, and boy does he look good. Uh, we got to send this to the recruits. I mean, if wow, <laughs> if your coach looks like that, right? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> We got a little sidetracked, but no. that's awesome. And and so I, I sat down with Rob, and I was like, I want to get to 235, and and I want to feel comfortable moving around, and I need to be able to move and run and, and, like, play at the level that our coaching staff wants me to play at here. And um, all summer, it was, like, an everyday thing. And early mornings, late nights, like, I would wake up, walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes on an incline, before I ate and then I'd go eat something really, really healthy. And then I'd come back and work out again, eat lunch, come back, work out. Like it was just like this nonstop go, 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 go. But I never got tired of it. And that's something that I struggled with in my early years at Bucknell was I wasn't playing. So I would work out, work out, work out. And I wasn't playing. So I'm like, what's the point in doing it? And it just got boring for me. And I, I didn't like it my freshman year. And, um, I ended up getting hurt and it really changed my mindset. But when I like here, it's just like, if you want to succeed and you want to play, like you have to step outside of that little bubble and, and just push the limits of like what you think you're able to do. And Rob really did that for me this summer. And, um, and like every day was like, I wake up and I get after it and then he would kill me in the weight room. But like at the end of the day, like he would just be like, good job today. And like that little, like, yeah, that like carries a lot of weight. And then like at the end of the summer, we did the uh, football field workout. It was the first time all summer I felt comfortable enough to like work out without a shirt on. And like I, I, I for the first time I got to like see that transformation. And I was just I was like I was really proud of myself. But like if for anybody who knows me, like I'm not ever going to settle for that. Mm -hmm. And like I still do the same workouts with Rob and I still push it. So you can't just settle and, and be OK with it. And speaking of our coaching staff pushing guys, one thing I've noticed in my short time here is the coaching staff, you know, from Rob and Brad, our strength and conditioning coaches, to our, you know, Coach Cow, Coach Justice, Coach Barbie, Coach Payne, is they're going to put you in positions to succeed, but it's not them that can do it for you. Mm -hmm. Our guys have to take ownership, and that's their big thing is you're, you're going to come here, we're going to treat you like a pro, you're going to be a man. And anything you achieve, we're gonna help you, but it's something you're gonna have to do on your own. We can't we can't play for you. We can't make your decisions for you. You know you're gonna have to be a grown up. You know you're away from home for the first time for a lot of these guys. Is you know the decisions you make are gonna directly impact you on the court, and that's just how it's gonna be at the next level. Once you're a lottery pick, you know you don't have a coaching staff that's worried about you 24 seven. You know mm -hmm. you're a professional, and so just kind of talk about. That adjustment, I know you spent a lot of time with Coach Payne. Coach Barbie recruited you. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of speak about your relationship with the coaching staff and how you've enjoyed that. I mean, each I, – I mean, throughout the, the staff, you have a, a different relationship with each guy. Um, but I, I think Coach Payne does a good job of of really pushing guys' limits and, and making them uncomfortable, like, every day. Like When you walk in for practice – and you're stretching and you're foam rolling and you're just trying to get loose and you see Coach Payne walk in, you're like, because he just has that <laughs> smile that's just like, I'm going to rip He's, your head off. He says a lot without saying much. Exactly. And and so, but like, I love it. And, and I've I've wanted to be pushed like this and, and I have been. And my senior year at Bucknell, I was pushed by two of my coaches there. And like, outside of like being pushed in practice, like I would work out with them and they would really push my limits. And when I got here, it's the same thing. And like Coach Barbie forces me to be a better defender and move ladder like if I don't do a drill to his standards which like, are very high yeah like I have to do it over and as an 18 year old kid I would have rolled my eyes and try like 
sunk down and shrugged my shoulders, but like I'm a grown up now and I understand like for me to be able to play at the level that I want to play at, like I have to be good at that. And so like he holds me to that standard and same thing with uh with Joel. Like he tells me to quit pump faking and just shoot it. And so like I have to work on that and I have been with him and and every like each coach is like a different relationship, uh, like as you move down the staff. And you've also you're our you're the oldest guy in the team. You've had the most Division One college basketball experience of anyone. And we have guys who come from all sorts of different backgrounds. You're a grad student. Johnny should still be in high school. We got dudes from Chicago, dudes from New York, and Jamaica, I guess, with Nick. <laughs> uh, I mean, we just have guys from all over the country. Tell me how it's been for you kind of being the veteran leader, the you know grown-up in the room with so many different – guys and talented young kids it's cool i mean my i think uh a really good comparison is my brother andrew is a captain in the marines and like he's in charge of 900 people from 900 different backgrounds i'm on a team with 13 guys 12 other guys that all come from different backgrounds so it's a smaller scale but like creating an individual relationship with those guys outside of the gym, outside of the locker room, hanging out with them outside of basketball, like that carries more weight when you get onto the court. Cause like that person knows that they can trust you. You can trust them. And like that trust goes on both ends of the court. And then all of that, like all those individual trusts can really like come together and turn into like a really, really scary sight. Come March. No, I agree. And a lot's made about your leadership your intangibles, you know, you're, you're everything you'd want from a senior grad transfer leader. But I think what people sometimes lose in that is how talented of a basketball player you are and how much actual production you're going to bring in terms of points, rebounds, steals, assists, things of that. Like, we know you're going to bring the leadership, but you're also going to have a direct impact on us achieving our goals. So kind of give people who haven't seen you play kind of a, a breakdown of your game a little bit, what you like to do, who you kind of, who you kind of try to play like if there's anyone. Yeah. Uh, I, I stretch the floor out a little bit. Um, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> being able to shoot the three. Um, I played guard my whole life up until like 10th grade. So I can't really dribble that well, but I was able to put the ball on the floor a little bit and then like straight line drives catch it, pump fake, one dribble pull-ups. Um, I've really been working on that with KP. Um, been working on getting to the rim and finishing through contact. Um, like you you practice finishing with dunks so that you go up every time like you're going to dunk it. And it's like sometimes you just don't. But um, being able to just stretch the floor out, being a good communicator, and like you said, like with the leadership stuff, like that's who I try to be always. But, I mean, there are times where – if like if you need a bucket, like I want to be one of those guys where it's like, all right, let's get him involved so that if I don't get get it for us, like I'm setting somebody else up for it. Um, and then just being able to like be a presence down low. Like I know that I'm not Nick and EJ in height, but I've played college basketball for four years. I've played against some pretty talented players in the post, and I've had good games against them. So like for me. I feel like if I can score on, on Nick and EJ and I can continue to do that, like I can do that on just about anybody. And I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, I'm the best post button. I'm not. But I definitely understand scoring on angles and scoring around people instead of trying to score over top of people. And Nate is a very, very humble guy. You'll, you guys don't get to see practice like I do every day. We have three really good big guys. Three really, really good guys. And we, we have a talented team. And it's going to be a really fun year. But kind of switching gears a little bit. Uh, speaking of your brothers being in the military, on your senior night last year, your brother uh, surprised you uh, coming back from deployment. Kind of let people know about that. Uh, tell people about that story and uh, what was going through your mind, what your emotions were. I mean, so I hadn't seen him in like almost two years and he's like my best friend. So I talked to him every day and, and in like January, he was asking me like, oh, he's, so I kept saying like, he's all, I can't wait to see you in May. I can't wait to see you in May. And I'm like, 
okay, like you're going to see me for graduation. Like I get that. Like, I know that. <laughs> like I'm aware. And the entire time he had been talking to my teammate, Matt O'Reilly and uh, Matt's family's from California. So they don't really get to come to many games. And Matt saved Andrew a ticket for uh, senior day. And like everybody in my family was there, my grandparents, my aunt and uncle, um, obviously like my mom and dad, my other siblings. So they like announced me and I was, I wasn't mad, but I was like, I was pretty upset that Andrew couldn't be there. Cause I was like, Oh, like, I wish everybody, cause we were all there for his senior day. And, uh, they like announced everybody and we take this picture. And then my coach hands me this big framed picture of me in the NCAA tournament. And, they were like, oh, wait, there's one more member of the Sustina family. And I just turned around, and he's walking out of the tunnel. I was mad at him because, like, he threw me off for the rest of the day. I think I, I, I told you last night, I was, like, 4 of 17 from the <laughs> field. Like, they were like, your first shot is either going to be cash or hit the glass. And i not joking. I think I hit the shot clock. <laughs> and I just – I was so thrown off, but I was so excited because, like, that is literally my best friend in the world, and I hadn't seen him in almost two years. So to be able to, like – have him be there for my last game um, and and to be able to watch us. And, like, he's really close with my teammates there. And for him to be able to watch that and watch us win um, was, was really, really special. And I was actually watching this game. Uh, I Like I said, I enjoy watching college basketball, and I know Bucknell is a good program. And they were playing Army. Army has a good point guard that I uh, – Tommy Funk I wanted to watch play. Mm-hmm. Uh and I was watching that game, and I remember I, – so I'm when I came to campus, Nate was one of the first people I met. You know, it was super good to me. And I was like, why does he seem so familiar? Obviously, I knew who he was because I knew he was, you know, on the roster for months. But then I was like, oh, my gosh, yeah. Like, that was – that was a pretty cool thing to watch. Uh, obviously, Nate's very close with his family. Uh, shifting gears again, kind of all over the place – but this is something we talked about before. We've had some good conversations about, and I think I'd love to have you share it with uh, people who are listening, if there's anyone out there. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you could go back and tell 18-year-old Nate Cecina on his first day of summer school at Bucknell, you know, you give him one piece of advice about the next four and a half years up to this point, what would you tell him? What have you learned through this process? What's... What's something you think is important? Just, uh, I would uh, just be coachable. Um, be open-minded. Like your co- your coaches are going to yell at you and they're going to say stuff to get under your skin, but they just- Very wanna, often. Yeah. <laughs> but they want to see how mentally tough you are. And I definitely struggled with that my freshman year at Bucknell. Um, just being, like being coached. Um, I had a really good high school coach and a really good assistant coach. and But I, because I was who I was in high school, I could get away with taking a possession off. I could get away with being a little lazy or being a little like lackadaisical throughout the game. And because at the end of the day, like if I got the ball, I could do whatever I wanted, especially in my high school conference. And when I got to college, I kind of had that same chip on my shoulder. And my first workout ever, I got dunked on three straight possessions by our center. And I was like, okay, this is a little bit different than high school, but um, just being coachable and like listening to what they say and not how they say it. Cause they're going to scream and yell at you, but like they're telling you what they want you to do. But like when you are listening, you only hear that like the tone of their voice and not what they're saying. So then like you just shut everything else off and shut everything else out. It's the same thing here. Like you said, we have five star recruits, guys that are going to go be pros that have never been coached like this. And their first initial reaction is to, really just shut down when you get yelled at and they've done a fantastic job since the beginning of the summer about that just listening to what coaches say and not how they say it no it's hard and that's something that only comes to me with experience and age uh i think fine wine (laughs) i think everyone's initial reaction uh especially when you're young is just you don't you don't like being told you're wrong you know, it's something a lot of our guys aren't used to. Mm-hmm. And I give them a lot of credit because they've, you know, they're five-star recruits. They're big-time guys. They're not used to being coached. But they understand when they come here, you know, you're not going to get treated the same way you did with your high school team. You might have had a great high school coach. You might have had a terrible high school coach who let you do whatever you want. 
you know, we all come from different backgrounds, but there's a standard of how you act here. And even if guys don't always like what the coaches are saying to them, they listen and they respect it. And, you know, obviously no one's perfect, but we have a, we have a lot of really good guys. What would you tell people that never get to be around our team? How, what's it like being around these guys? How do you enjoy it? What's it, what's the average, like we went to a haunted house, (laughs) just kind of give a, give a little insight into what it's like just spending some time with these guys, even away from basketball. Uh, I mean, everybody sees them and they see them on social media and think of them as these superstars and these rock stars. And I mean, they are like in their own respect, but it's like, they're still 18 year old kids. You put all this pressure on these kids to win a national championship, but it's like, you don't see him outside of basketball. You don't know what he's going through on a daily basis, mentally or physically. Like, College basketball is very, very fun, but it's also very hard because you have all this stuff going on. You have stuff at home that you can't control. You have stuff here that you can't control, stuff here that you can control. And then you just have this, everybody has this internal battle that like you don't see. They put all this pressure on themselves on, on themselves to be a pro at the end of the year, but it's like you have to focus now so that that happens. But if you sit here and have this projection of like, oh, this is what I want to be, and you only focus on that, everything else just falls apart. No, and that's one thing with Kentucky basketball that I think gets lost in the grand scheme of college basketball is we're so used to having guys who come in, produce right away as freshmen, end up being the number one overall draft pick, being lottery picks. My freshman year at UC Irvine, I played about 160 minutes, and I thought I had a good year. Mm -hmm. You know, freshmen is just 95% of the programs in the country. Freshmen don't just come in and run your program and dominate. Mm -hmm. You know, most places, my my freshman year at UC Irvine, we started four sophomores and a junior. And our coach talked about how young our team was. You know, here, if we started four sophomores and a junior, they'd be like, what's wrong with our guys that they came back for two and three years? Mm -hmm. You know, and just kind of talk about – that I, it's so weird to me when I hear Coach Cow reference sophomores as veterans, <laughs> and that's what they are here. You know, they're yeah. guys that have been through the battles, been through the program, and there's, you know, you go through one year of Kentucky basketball and you really go through the fire. Yeah. And so just kind of talk about how how that's been, where you know, going from Bucknell, where you didn't really play double. I'm looking at your stats. I don't believe you played double figure minutes until your senior year. Mm -hmm. So what's, how's that adjustment been? uh, And how, how did you deal with that as, you know, as a young kid, not having the success you wanted right away? It's, I mean, it was frustrating. Like I said, I could do whatever I wanted in high school. And then I come in now and it's like, I didn't unzip my warm up until December. I had never not been the guy that got chosen to be on the team or to be like to start And for the first time in my life, like, I didn't have that. And it, it like, took me by surprise because, like, I've typically, if something, like, didn't go my way in sports, I would just, like, dominate and to earn it back. And, like, I couldn't do that. And I kind of, like, lost that drive a little bit my freshman year. And then I got hurt, so I lost it completely. And then coming back as a sophomore, I came back in really good shape. And I was like, oh, well. I didn't play that many minutes. I'm like, well, I put all this work in, blah, blah, blah. And my junior year, same thing. I was like, I'm going to really come in. I'm really going to surprise everybody. And I did, but, like, played behind two all-conference guys. And so then I'm sitting here, and I'm like, well, what the heck? Like, why am I not playing more? And then, like, my senior year, I really realized that, like, I needed to just keep up that same level of intensity and, and passion and, like, focus throughout the whole year to be able to to be able to play and like you said like we have what three sophomores and a junior well two juniors you're a junior but like yes that is like a veteran team here and like that's not a veteran team elsewhere yeah like nick has played in three NCAA tournaments ashton emmanuel and uh ej played in one like that is a veteran group here and, like, I've played in two, so, like, I can kind of add to that. But, like, I never made it past the first round. And, like, these guys have been to Elite Eights, Sweet Sixteens. And it's, like, at other, like you said, at other places, that's a really, really young team. 
because you typically have guys that are going to stay here for four years. You'll have five or six seniors. And then, like, here we have seven freshmen or six freshmen. Like, that's absurd. It is. And it's tough, you know, coming from never – I mean, our guys play on national TV because – in high school because they're the elite of the elite. But you don't play on every game this year is going to be on national television. Every mistake they make, every time they get yelled at, it's going to be right in front of their family's faces. It's it's an adjustment that I don't think people really understand. And every day, it's hard to be happy when you're not playing well. Facts. And so I don't think people realize when a guy has a bad game, they're much more upset about it than you are. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, they don't just get to say, okay, the game's over. I get to go back to being a 19-year-old kid now. They have to, you know, whatever the result was, they're carrying that five times what anyone else is carrying. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, I'm sure many people that are listening follow you on Instagram. And one of the uh, things you've adopted since you've been here is uh, coffee and conversation, as you like to call it. Uh, <laughs> Me and Rob. Oh, Yes. Uh, how, talk about how that happened and what you guys, uh, what you guys try and talk about. I mean, Rob is Rob's one of the most consistent people that I've gotten to know. Like every day, show up. He's in a good mood. Wants to get better. He's going to push you to get better. Like if if he's having a bad day, like you won't know it. And we both like coffee. And one time I was in there in the morning lifting and. I was just like, we were just joking around and we were like, let's go get coffee sometime, like on a day where we don't have anything. And on one of our off days, walked across the street, sat down, got some Starbucks, sat down, just talked for like two hours. And it ranged from talking about basketball to talking about strength coaches and different strength coaches that we've both kind of been around, Um, like both of our journeys to like to being where we are here. And then, like, our families and, like, why we do what we do. And then we were, like, joking around about it. We're like, oh, we should turn this into something. And then it just kind of, like, was an Instagram story, was an Instagram story. And then, like, kind of blew up. And, like, every like we, we were talking about doing, like, special guests and stuff. Like, just joking around. Well, then Monica, the nutritionist, wanted mm-hmm. to come and, like. Talk about a Talk about a power group, right? Oh, there. I know. <laughs> That's what created this monster. That's yeah. sitting next to me. <laughs> oh my god! 